Hi, my name is Wouter Emery and I'm the founder of Airshaper. In this first video in our series on how wind tunnels work, we'll study the basic layout of a low-speed aerodynamic wind tunnel. But first, a bit of history. Wind tunnels were invented in the late 19th century, and even the Wright brothers used a simple version of it to study basic shapes for their Wright flyer, the first plane ever. The principle of a wind tunnel is quite simple. Use a single or multiple fans to force air across an object to study its aerodynamic properties. In an open return tunnel, the air is drawn from the environment in which the tunnel is located. This type of wind tunnel is typically cheaper to construct and it doesn't suffer too much from exhaust or smoke gases accumulating on the inside. It is however quite expensive to run, as you constantly need to accelerate fresh air from standstill to the velocity that you need. And it's also more difficult to obtain a good flow quality, as the air needs to curve into the inlet. And with an open exit, it can become quite noisy too. Then there's the closed return tunnel, in which the exit air is being fed back into the inlet. This design is much more energy efficient, as the fan only needs to overcome the losses in the circuit, and it's a lot quieter too, and has the potential for a higher flow quality. Downsides are, because the air circulates, it can heat up quite a lot, sometimes even requiring cooling, and smoke and exhaust gases can accumulate inside. Whichever return type you go for, it's very important to have good flow characteristics at the test section. Typically, the goal is to have low turbulence intensity, a uniform flow velocity, and a thin boundary layer. Let's have a look at the typical components of a wind tunnel and how they're set up to achieve this. First, the fan pushes the air forward. As the air hits the first corner, it goes through a set of turning vanes, which help to straighten the flow and to reduce the pressure losses. After the last corner, the air hits the settling chamber, where it first needs to go through a honeycomb structure. This is basically a set of tubes that force the air to move in a parallel way, to reduce the swirl. After exiting the honeycomb, the air needs to pass through a number of screens, which are composed of wires interwoven together to form a square or rectangular mesh. This mesh imposes a static pressure drop to the flow, which is proportional to the square or the velocity and this will penalize velocities higher than the average and will boost velocities which are below the average. This helps to reduce variations in longitudinal flow velocity. Also, the screens help to break up large eddies into smaller ones which decay faster. Now as you may have noticed, the cross section of all these components except for the test section is quite large. One of the reasons for this is that this large cross-section reduces the flow velocity, which, in turn, reduces the pressure losses in the system. But you still need a high flow velocity in the test section, so just before the air hits the test section, coming from the settling chamber, there is a contraction that will help to speed up the air and further improve the flow quality. And after it exits the test section, it's the opposite scenario. In the diffuser, it will slow down again just before it hits the fan. So that was it for our first video in our series on how wind tunnels work. Stay tuned for more, because we'll be discussing measurement techniques, sizing issues and many more. If you liked the video, please click the like button and drop an interesting comment to start a discussion. And stay tuned for the next one. Thanks for watching, see you soon, bye bye.